Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm bursting with joy to return to Alan Watts. It's been a very long time since we read some Alan Watts on the podcast. Sorry for the delay. Alan Watts is so amazing, so different, carries such wisdom. I could sit and listen to Alan Watts forever. Here I found some writings that I wanted to go over a little bit. We can call this Ecstasy is Inevitable. Attachment and control. When we were babies, we didn't know anything other than what we felt. And we didn't have names for that. As we grew older, we learned to differentiate one thing from another, one event from another, and ourselves from everything. And that's all well and good as long as we don't forget the foundation. Mountains are differentiated from one another, but their foundation is the same. And we might have different words for different mountains, but they aren't any words for their foundation because words are only for distinctions and there can't really be a word or an idea for that matter for non-distinction we can feel it of course but we can't think it we feel that we're conscious but we don't know what consciousness itself is because consciousness is present in every conceivable kind of experience Presumably, a fish doesn't know anything about water because it never leaves water. However, when we grow up, we forget the foundation. We become fascinated, spellbound, and enchanted by all the things adults wave at us, and we forget the background. We come to think that all these distinctions we've learned about are most important things to be concerned with, and we become hypnotized. We get stuck focusing on flashy distinctions that we think truly matter. In Buddhism, the sense of mistaken stuckness is called attachment. Attachment doesn't refer to things like enjoying dinner or appreciating beauty or sleep, and it isn't about certain responses like fear or sorrow. These are all natural responses of our organism to its environment. The Sanskrit word is klesha, and a better translation than attachment might be the slang term hang up. You know, we get hung up on this or that thing. We get stuck or blocked or can't remove ourselves from a state of waggly hesitation. That's what's meant by the term cliche. We get these hang ups about all types of things, and we are taught to have hang ups by our parents and aunts and uncles and teachers and peer group. And two major hang ups we're taught from early childhood are the distinction between ourselves and others and the distinction between voluntary and involuntary actions. This is immensely confusing to a child. For example, it's told to go to sleep or have a bowel movement or love its parents or stop being anxious, but all these things are just supposed to happen on their own. So the child is commanded to do what will please its elders and betters, but it must be done spontaneously it's no wonder that we're all so confused. In response, we develop this thing called ego. Now, I want to be clear what I mean by ego. I don't mean something synonymous with our particular living organism, but something rather abstract. The ego has the same function and kind of reality as an hour or an inch or a pound or a line of longitude. It's for purposes of discussion, for convenience. We have an ego due to social convention, but the fallacy we all make is that we treat this abstraction as if it were something real and physical. But the ego is merely a composition of ideas and images about ourselves. This image is obviously no more us than the idea of a tree is a tree. Additionally, the image we carry about ourselves is extremely inaccurate and incomplete. My image of me is not at all your image of me. And my image of you is not at all your image of you. Furthermore, my image of me leaves out all manner of information regarding my nervous system, circulation, metabolism, and all sorts of subtle relationships with the surrounding human and non-human universe. In other words, the image I have of myself, my ego, is a caricature. I arrived at this image mainly through my interaction with other people who told me who I was in one way or the other either directly or indirectly. And I play that picture of myself out into the world and the world plays it back. And from early on, we are told that this picture, this image must be consistent. 
For a lot of people, the quest for identity means searching for an acceptable image. What role am I supposed to play? What am I supposed to do in life? Those questions are important, but they are extraordinarily misleading unless they're backed up by deeper matters. You might protest and say that you don't think of yourself as just an image. You might say that you feel more real than that, that you are the center of something. Well, let's take a look. Who are you in terms of your body? If you look at yourself, all you can see are your feet and legs and belly and arms and hands and some vague part of your nose. If you close one eye and you assume you have a head because everyone else has a head or you looked in the mirror and the mirror reflected your head back to you, but you never really see your head just as you never really see your back. So naturally you put your ego in that unseen part of your body because that seems to be where it all comes from and you can feel it. But what is it that you feel? If I see clearly, if my eyes are in functioning order, my eyes aren't conscious of themselves. I mean, unless I see spots or detect some kind of deficiency in my vision, I don't notice that I'm seeing. So if my ego is working properly, why should I be aware of it as something sort of there? That's just a nuisance, something in the way, especially since the ego is awfully difficult to take care of. So that can't be what we feel. What we feel is a kind of chronic, habitual sense of muscular strain. And that's what we learned as children when we were taught to perform spontaneous activities on command. We feel that tension when someone tells us to look carefully or pay attention. We try to use our muscles to make our nerves work, which is futile and actually gets in the way of the nerves working properly. We hold our breath. We control our emotions. We tighten our stomachs and rectums out of fear. We pull ourselves together. This chronic tension in Sanskrit is called Sankocha, contraction, the root of what we call the feeling of ego. This feeling of tightness is the physical referent for the psychological image of ourselves. The ego is naturally useful for social communication. I'm this idea of a being with a particular name. That works fine, provided we know what we're doing and take it for what it is. But we're so hung up on this concept that it confuses us even in the proposition that it might be possible for us to feel otherwise. When we hear about people transcending the ego, we think, gosh, how did they do that? That's a ridiculous thing to think. They transcended the ego because it was never really there in the first place. You can't transcend the ego any more than you can cut a wheel of cheese with a line of longitude. Let's suppose you're a baby again. You don't know anything. All these words are just noise. Don't try to make it otherwise. Don't make any effort. Naturally, you feel certain tensions in your body. Or words or ideas will drift through your mind. But it's just like the wind blowing or clouds moving across the sky. Don't bother with any of that. You don't have to get rid of anything. Just be aware of what's going on in your body and mind, just as you might be aware of clouds in the sky. There's no problem with any of it. Just look and feel and listen without naming. And if you are naming, that's okay. Just watch that. You can't force anything here. You can't willfully stop thinking or stop naming. Do you notice? This doesn't mean you are bad at meditating. It's not a sign of defeat. It's just illustrating that everything runs on all by itself. It's just showing you that an individual separate you is a figment of your imagination. So remember, you're a baby. You feel things happening, but you don't know anything about the difference between those things and you. No one has taught you that distinction yet. Nobody has taught you that what you see out in front of you is either near or far from your eyes. Let's call everything you sense and feel this. It's everything that's going on. It's what the Chinese call Tao or what the Buddhists call suchness or Tathata. And it's not happening to you because what is you? You're just an aspect of the happening. So who's in control around here? It's a strange notion that there's someone or something in control as if process requires 
something outside of themselves to control themselves. Why can't processes be self-controlling? We say, control yourself, as if you could split a person in two with one part separate from the self that's supposed to be controlled. How can that achieve anything? How can a noun start a verb? Yet it's a fundamental superstition we have that this can be done. You have this spontaneous process going on that's controlling itself, aware of itself, aware of itself through you. You're an aperture through which the universe looks at itself. And because it's looking at itself through you, there's always an aspect of itself that it can't see. And this results in a game of hide and seek. But when you ask, who is doing the seeking? You are still working under the assumption that every verb needs a subject. If you assert that knowing requires a knower, you're simply applying particular grammatical rules to nature. However, many languages use verbs without nouns, and when you actually look for doers, as distinct from deeds, you can't find them, just as you can't find any stuff underlying the patterns of nature. What we call stuff is simply patterns seen out of focus. We use these words, energy, matter, being, reality, Tao, universe. Did you know that universe means one turn? It's your turn now. You turn to look at yourself, but you can't make two turns to see what's looking. As they say in Zen, you can't grasp it and you can't get rid of it. And in not being able to grab it, you get it. This is what gurus have used to trick you into seeing. All these trials they put you through are simply to convince you that you can't do anything about it, but not convince you in a theoretical way. I'm not a guru. I don't give individual spiritual direction to people. So maybe it's not the best thing that I'm giving away the guru's tricks. But I might as well. You can struggle and struggle and struggle and you will do so for as long as you have the feeling inside of you that you're missing something. And everyone will encourage you to think this way because they also feel they're missing something. And they think they can get it by such and such a method. So they're going to try to convince you that their method is the thing to do. Gurus use this behavior to beguile their students. The guru gives tasks that seem difficult, but can be accomplished. This gives you a feeling of making progress. But the guru also assigns tasks that are impossible. And these are what you'll get hung up on. And the impossible exercises will make you double your efforts in solving the impossible ones. There might be multiple ranks or levels through which you can advance, just like degrees in masonry or belt levels in judo, different stages of consciousness, that sort of thing. And because you retain this sense of something missing, you get in competition with yourself and others. But all this effort and competition and searching is just like looking for your own head. You can't see it. So you might imagine you've lost it. And that's the point. We don't see what looks. So we think we've lost it. So we go off in search of ourselves or God or the Atman or whatever. But it's the one thing we can't find because we are already it. So you can't do anything to find it. And if you tell yourself, well, then there's nothing I can do about it. Why did you say that? Why might you go out of your way to note that futility? It's because there's a funny feeling you have that if you tell yourself that there's nothing you can do about it, something different will happen. But even that doesn't work. Nothing works. And when absolutely nothing works, where are you? The world doesn't stop. Things keep happening. That's what I'm talking about. There's this happening going on when you aren't not doing anything about it. That's the point. It goes on despite anything you think or worry about. You might call this determinism, but you'd be wrong. There's no one being determined. And if you conceive of determinism as the direction of what happens by the past, the idea that the past causes the present and future, you're hallucinating. The present does not come from the past. You can realize this yourself by closing your eyes and listening to the sounds around you. Where do they come from? You hear them coming out of silence. They come and go like echoes in the labyrinth of your brain. Sounds don't come from the past. They come from the present and trail off. 
You can do this exercise with your eyes too. For example, you're watching someone on television. Look at their hands. When they move, we think that the movement is caused by the hands and that the hands were there before, so they can therefore move after. We don't see that our memory of the hands is an echo of their always being now. They never were. They never will be. They are always now. The motion of the hands is recollected like the wake of a ship. The wake doesn't move the ship, and the past doesn't move the present unless you insist that it does. Eventually, you will become aware that this happening isn't happening to you, because you are the happening. The only you there is, is what's going on. Feel that and disregard the stupid distinctions you've been taught because they won't help you to feel the happening genuinely. And understand that all of this isn't determined. You will experience an odd feeling of synthesis between doing and happening. Doing is as much a happening as happening is, and happening is as much a doing as doing is. This is the profound experience some people have that outside of the proper understanding can lead them to proclaim themselves as the omnipotent God almighty in the Hebrew or Christian sense. Well, you are omnipotent, but not in that way. I am omnipotent insofar as I am the universe, but I am not omnipotent in the role of Alan Watts, only cunning. With this in mind, let's examine the question of pain and our so-called reactions to it. Once again, you will see that when you look at the problem this way, it immediately sets up a duality of pain on one side and the person who suffers it on the other. It should be evident that when a great deal of energy of pain is derived from the resistance offered to it, and that resistance can take many forms. You might try to run away from a migraine, for example, and quickly realize that you can't, that it seems to be absolutely in the middle of everything, and however much you resist it, the pain follows you. A lot of this type of pain is doubly problematic because of our prior anxiety about it as well as the judgments we have about pain. For example, in a hospital, it is taboo to scream because the hospital is not run for you. It is run for the convenience of the staff. Everything is done in a way so as to interiorize localized pain. So we have a big social problem right from the beginning about our reaction to anything painful. For example, when a child eats something that doesn't agree with her and she vomits, everyone says, ugh, but the experience of vomiting is actually one of release. It's a pleasant release from the suffering of an upset stomach. So people learn from their parents or teachers that vomiting is nasty, just as they learn that excrement is nasty, just as they learn that anything associated with death and disease is unpleasant. But there really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying. Who said you were supposed to survive? Who gave you the idea that it's preferable to go on and on and on? Obviously, we can't go on living. We'd overcrowd ourselves for one thing. So in actuality, a person who dies is honorable because he or she is making room for others on the planet. Nothing else is workable. Even if we could live forever and ever, we'd eventually realize that it wasn't the way we wanted to survive. Why else have children? Children are our survival. We pass the torch on to them. You don't carry the torch forever. You offer it to someone else. It's a far more amusing arrangement for nature to continue the process of life through different individuals than by doing it through the same individuals forever. When we look at life in terms of survival and profit, we miss out on the magic. Watch children every day. Things are marvelous to them because they see things in a fresh manner, not related to survival or profit. Even scratches on the floor possess magic for a child. And since over time we cease to see the magic in the world, we no longer fulfill nature's game of being aware of itself. So we die. There's no point to life otherwise. Someone new comes along, appreciates the world with entirely fresh eyes, and nature's self-awareness game continues on as a game worth the candle. It's not natural for us to want to prolong life indefinitely. However, we live in a culture that tries to convince us at every turn that death is a terrible thing, that death must be swept under the carpet. For example, look at how we treat the elderly in the hospitals. Grandma is dying. She suspects that she is dying, but the family and doctor conspire to keep from grandma the very obvious fact that she is dying. For some reason, the family has this funny feeling that it's important to build up courage and hope so they lie. Oh, you're getting better. You'll probably be up and about in a couple of weeks. 
A mutual distrust develops because once you're playing the game on that level, you tend to play the mistrust out on other levels. And grandma's left to die alone, suddenly unprepared and doped up to the point where death occurs without any spiritual experience of it whatsoever. When I was in Zurich in 1958, I met a most extraordinary man by the name of Karl Fried von Durkheim. He was a former Nazi agent who had been sent to Japan to disseminate propaganda. He wound up studying the Zen and experienced a spiritual rebirth while being imprisoned after the war, eventually returning to Germany and opening a meditation center in the Black Forest. He devoted his work to people who had undergone spiritual crises during the war, and what he found time and again was people who had experienced what he termed natural satori under the threat of death. People had heard the bombs coming. They had heard the particular whistle. And they had known they were headed right for them. Well, what happened was these people who knew they were finished had accepted it. And when they accepted it, they had a strange feeling that everything was absolutely clear. That everything in the entire universe was just as it should be. Every grain of dust in the universe was in exactly the right place. And they completely understood at that moment what everything was all about, only they couldn't describe it. So these people with these profound experiences would try to talk to their families about what they had seen and felt, but no one would listen. Oh, you were under a lot of pressure. You were probably hallucinating, that sort of thing. But Durkheim listened to them and believed that these weren't hallucinations, but exceedingly rare examples of people actually waking up. This is the opportunity presented by death. If you can go into death with eyes open in support of others, this extraordinary thing can happen to you. And from that vantage point, you'd say, I wouldn't have missed that opportunity for the world. Now I understand why we die. The reason we die is to give us the opportunity to understand what life is all about. And we can only experience that when we let go because it is only then that we come to a situation that the ego can't deal with. When we are no longer hypnotized, our natural consciousness can see clearly what all this universe is for. But we miss this opportunity. We institutionalize death out of the way instead of encouraging a social acceptance of death, instead of rejoicing in death. I'm not saying that our deathbed, we need laughter and balloons and presents. I'm just saying we need a new approach instead of putting on long faces and making a sad show out of it particularly Christians who presumably believe they're going to heaven, we owe it to ourselves to work out an entirely new approach to death. It's understandable that some people die with concerns about their spouse and children. However, no one is indispensable, and there comes a point when you have to say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to abandon all of my responsibilities because there's nothing else I can do. That's another form of surrender. When you drop everything in this way, a curious thing happens. It dawns on you, that to be important, existence does not have to go on. I needn't last any more than a moment. Quantitative continuity has little value. How long can you hold your breath? Who cares? We don't have to suffer being bombed or put into concentration camps. In this very moment, we can be as those about to die. We can genuinely and honestly understand the mystery of life because death is, in a certain sense, the source of life. In the forest, leaves die and fall off the tree to the forest floor. They mold and rot and supply hummus from which more plants grow. That's the cycle. But we try to stop that cycle from happening. Look at what morticians do. Make the body unpalatable to worms as if being eaten were an indignity to the human being. Why? We eat everything else and we give nothing back. That's a symptom of our profound disorientation with respect to death. Not only do we consider death an indignity, but we also send pregnant women to hospitals for the most unnatural, weird kind of birthing. More and more, we regard the healthy and inevitable and natural transformations of the body as pathological. Soon, we'll have to have sexual intercourse on operating tables to make sure the whole operation is hygienic. More and more, everything about us is becoming interfered with by specialists, while less and less we consider our lives the province of our own preferences. We can't even die in our own way without going to the hospital and being fed through tubes and wasting the family's savings. For what? But let's get practical. You might argue that this is all fine and good, but once you are told you're going to die, you'll undoubtedly look for a way out of it and go into some sort of panic. 
and this panic in the face of death is in you in some uncontrollable way. You have an instinct to survive, and the instinct arises as this panic. Okay, let's take another step. You might also feel ashamed of that panic. Even though you've been taught to do everything possible to survive, you might feel as if you're supposed to face death calmly and bravely and not be panicked. Well, if you are in a panic and can't stop, that's another opportunity, just as people experience profound insight at the moment of death because they can't do anything whatsoever to prevent it. So too can panic provide the same opportunity for enlightenment. However, if you think, I must stop panicking, then all that will happen is greater confusion and panic. You'll be at a cross purpose with yourself. Old fashioned preachers went on and on about death. Catholic monks kept human skulls on their desks in broke times. They made tombstones covered with marvelous sculptures of skeletons and bones. Some churches in Rome contained crypts with altar furnishings made entirely from the bones of the departed monks. Tibetan Buddhists practice graveyard meditation, even using trumpets made from human thigh bones and ritual cups made from human skulls, richly worked in silver and turquoise. From our point of view today, all this is very morbid, but what's the problem? What's blocking us from contemplating death regularly like this? You might say it's because it scares you that death gives you the heebie-jeebies. Okay then, so death isn't the problem, the heebie-jeebies are the problem. So let's deal with the heebie-jeebies in a familiar way. Don't try to stop them or ignore them because they are very valuable. They won't stop you from dying, but you can learn from the same thing you can learn from dying. But the social pressure to resist fear is terrific. Heebie-jeebies and fears are not just permissible. What's the reasoning behind this? I think we have this cultural assumption that if you're afraid, you can't perform under pressure. Basically, we think that if you have the heebie-jeebies, you can't be a good soldier. You'll just crumble under the weight of your fear. This is nonsense. Courageous people are often those who are quite frightened. Courageous action isn't a consequence of having no fear. Additionally, I think we also suppress the heebie-jeebies because of their orgiastic aspects. Extreme situations, terror, extreme pain, and so on involve the same sort of physiological oscillating process as sexual orgasm and we get embarrassed by that because it conflicts with our image of ourselves as composed and in control. If you looked at a photo of your face during sexual rapture but didn't understand the context, you wouldn't be able to tell if you were in pleasure or pain. A tide of vibrations has taken over your whole being as if you were in the possession of a god and that's taboo. Some of you might think this discussion is getting out of line because we're moving into an uncomfortable or perverse topic, but here we go. Two primary forms of what we call perverse experiences are sadism and masochism, both of which associate pain with ecstasy. Even if we think this sort of thing is pathological, it's actually quite common, and I'm referring here to a situation where sadists and masochists happily meet, when the combination of the two is voluntary and perfect. There's an important principle at work here. Pain and attendant convulsive behavior of the orgasm are associated with the erotic. A different value is given to the symptoms. In the total abandonment to those sensations, it's possible to feel united with what's happening, completely at one. That's what we all aspire to. The masochist is someone who has learned to defend against pain by eroticizing it, by simply a matter of placing different valuations on the same vibration. All we experience is a spectrum of vibrations, light, sound, smell, tactile feelings, emotions, everything. We live in the midst of a woven tapestry in which the warps and woofs are all these different spectra of different various kinds of vibrations. If you didn't have one, you wouldn't have the other because it takes two to reveal the pattern. We are patterns in a weaving system. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for the interlocking of all these different spectra of dimensions. And when a vibration reaches a certain point, we think it's too much. And when it falls to a different point, we think it's not enough. At one end, it's so subtle that we might go to sleep. But at the other end, it might feel as if things were going to rip right apart. And someone in this experience of tension might panic and will tell that person to relax and take it easy. But you can't often do that. So for the person who can't relax, I say go into that tension, go in the direction of least resistance, scream, get violent inside, that sort of thing. 
one way or the other it doesn't matter which way you go when the boat of life begins to rock but I think you might as well rock with it than against it ecstasy is inevitable it doesn't matter which road we take to get there in a way ecstasy is the nature of existence a universe exists for the simple reason that it is ecstatic what else are these fireworks about when you know that everything is all right and that the situation is inevitable ecstasy you won't make such a fuss about everything and the question what shall I do disappears as it should have in the beginning because there was never a real I there in the first place the question will bring you back to the experience itself some people hear this and immediately worry that this understanding will lead to everyone becoming totally callous and impassive and I can't assure you that this won't happen but if you experience this state of being you'll find out yourself we commonly think that children particularly babies are inferior in view to adults if an adult showed signs of a baby undifferentiated non-selective awareness psychologists would call this regression in actuality we need the baby's view as the basis for the adult view because if we don't have that basis we take the adult view selective awareness far too seriously we get completely carried away it's like someone playing poker and losing their nerve because they have gotten that it's only a game so he or she becomes a very bad player in life we're all playing a game but we've forgotten that because we've lost the infant's way of seeing but what we actually need is both ways of seeing that's a buddha's view we know both so we aren't taken in by adult games although we're perfectly capable of playing them it's just that we don't take them too seriously when we ask how we can recapture the baby's point of view that's the wrong question because it arises entirely and exclusively out of the adult's point of view the adult way of viewing things thinks there is an I that exists independent of everything else this sense of isolated I is merely a convention it has no fundamental reality and so long as we don't understand that we're confused the only way to regain a child's view is to realize that you can't do anything about it at all can't even do nothing about it all possibilities of vision for what I call I are out so long as you are trying or not trying you are aggravating the sensation of a separate ego that presents a certain difficulty or so it seems it's not just the ego that's an illusion but the whole valuation system we place on everything all these distinctions we make about the complexity of vibrations we call life all the valuations manufactured by the social game are Maya it's only play when we say one thing is good and another is bad or one event is advantageous and another is disadvantageous you might not think this hypnosis is impossible to overcome that not thinking that way is unthinkable of course you have to think that the process of hypnosis has put you into the suggestion that you forgot the whole thing and all these learned rules are sacrosanct we've been hypnotized this way ever since we were receptive children it's part of the conspiracy we play on ourselves we can't blame our parents because their parents played the same con on them we can't blame this on the past we're creating the values of the past right now in the present we're buying them all along psychology has ensured that American parents are consumed with guilt about the way they bring up their children but we must abandon completely the notion of blaming the past for any kind of situation we're in we must reverse our thinking and see the past always flows back from the present now is the creative point of life for example when you forgive someone you change the meaning of the past or when you're reading a sentence in German or Latin where the verb awaits you at the very end it's only then that you find out the sentence meaning the present is always changing the past so when you tell yourself that you can't obtain this undifferentiated open way of seeing don't take that thought too seriously it's simply a method of postponing realization you can keep putting it off that's perfectly okay there's no real reason or compulsion for why you should come out of this illusion notice that Buddhists don't tend to be missionaries in the same way as Western people it isn't urgent that you be saved unless you think so unless you are so disturbed by the problem of suffering and you just need to find an escape otherwise no hurry there's lots of time maybe you'll see through it all when you die at the moment of death you'll see that it was all a fake so don't be put off or frightened by the difficulty of seeing through the illusion that's a red herring and it's quite irrelevant 
teachers will tell you that your realization is going to take a long 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 time only after practice maybe it will maybe it won't really it's beside the point it's distracting if I recommend a book to you and tell you that it's incredibly difficult to read and will require years of your life and immense powers of concentration well that will likely just kill your interest in the book I should say something like this is a most extraordinary book it's just fascinating I've been reading it for years and every time I pick it up I get so involved that I just can't put it down isn't that a more encouraging attitude if we can see that ego is purely fictitious that it is merely an image of ourselves coupled with a sensation of muscular strain occasioned by trying to make this image an effective agent to control emotion and direct the nervous operations of our organism then it becomes clear that what we have called ourselves isn't able to do anything at all if we realize that a kind of silence follows in which there is nothing to do except watch what happens but what is happening is watching itself there is nobody apart from it watching it what about the other illusions although they are integrated with the illusion of ego the whole value system that is important good bad pleasant painful and so on can be called into question not in order to destroy the system but in order to see it for what it is again you might object and think that seeing through these valuations is a colossally difficult task because you have been habituated to it your whole life and you think the longer you've been habituated to something the more difficult it is to change it that's only true if you believe it it's not true if you don't believe it Zen emphasizes immediate action when anything is to be done it should be done immediately without thinking it over in advance you'll find this to be a characteristic of people who have been trained in Zen they don't sit around and debate with themselves about how to do something they just do it so you don't have to hem and haw about calling into question your whole value system just do it you might be in the habit of eating a roast beef sandwich for lunch every day but at any moment you can choose to try a smoked salmon and you don't have to put a lot of thought into it just eat a different sandwich we've been conditioned to assess this complex of vibrations as good bad pleasant painful and so on but as a matter of fact they are nothing but vibrations and if you try to look at any one of them by itself you won't be able to find it that is to say if you only know red you don't know that it's red you only know it's red in contrast to yellow and green and blue and violet you don't know that a particular sound is loud unless you are familiar with soft sounds these comparisons give us the feeling of the spectrum as being varied otherwise we wouldn't know so we can see that all the values we place on these vibrations are arbitrary they're just vibrations and if you think this is all nonsense you're correct this is how the universe works a lot of music is nonsense it doesn't mean anything but it can be very interesting when you were a child you often took delight in perfectly meaningless things for example those door stoppers with springs that make a, a boing sound boing 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 that's fascinating it doesn't mean anything it's just boing and if you really get into that boing sound you can see the whole universe in boing because each vibration implies all others vibrations are fascinating we have a tendency to take such an interest in vibrations that we're willing to risk danger to do so children are always daring each other to do something forbidden because the risk of calamity or disapproval makes the game so exciting for the same reason adults challenge disaster with all manner of wildly adventurous activities skydiving for example because that provides a certain vibration they find extremely interesting why the craving for speed and so on you can only get this if you look at a vibration very closely for example repeating a mantra or phrase or your own name over and over and over and over again after a while it becomes meaningless it's just noise but the sound isn't just noise that's just an adult attitude about the experience a child doesn't hear boing and think well that's just a noise a child understands that sound is just fantastic the whole world is energy at play it is a kaleidoscope of jazz you can really get into that and pay attention to a certain vibration and realize that it is the whole point of being alive but other people won't like it the guardians of the game will accuse you of doing something very dangerous or they'll call you crazy theological texts are full of fear that the universe is meaningless and that fear pervades our culture 
but only because people haven't dared to look. And people with severe depression perceive the world as meaningless, but worse. A conspiracy of horror, for example. Well, if you imagine that everything is mechanical, that we're basically fleshy computers in some grand clockwork system, you get a sense of the world is plastic, tasteless, or hollow. But that's still evaluation. If you think this is the way of the world, you're devaluing the mechanical and praising the organic, just as we don't enjoy a plastic flower because it doesn't have a scent. But the world is neither organic nor mechanical, and it is neither voluntary nor involuntary. It is simply what it is, beyond the categories of our contrasting selective awareness. Seeing through that, we experience what the Buddhists call suchness or to thought of based on the word that, 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 that's what's going on. In some meditative states, you can see everything as that. And you don't immediately evaluate that as meaningless because if you see the world as an illusion, you can still choose to take the world quite seriously. But you'll always know in the back of your mind that it's a game. So you can get involved in life to a ridiculous degree because you know it's all right. It's just vibrations. That's why enlightened people, even bodhisattvas, aren't detached and indifferent. They're perfectly free to enjoy and suffer emotions and attachments. R.H. Blythe, who was a great Zen man, once wrote me, How are you these days? As for me, I have abandoned Satori altogether, and I'm trying to become as deeply attached as I can to as many people and things as possible. So you might normally approach life cautiously, but seeing the world as that makes it possible for you to become much more involved, to feel, love, and throw yourself at the mercy of these goings-on completely. The very perception of the illusion makes it possible to live up to the illusion. If you see someone who carries a detached and reserved attitude toward life, it just indicates they are fearful of getting involved. I can't understand that very well. What do people expect? That an enlightened person shouldn't need this, that, or the other? That they can't appreciate beauty or sexual attraction? It seems some spiritual people want to scrub everything down like they want to scrub the planet clean of this disease called life and enjoy a nice clean rock. Well, I believe in color. If we're going to participate in this illusory dance, then let's really live it up. Let's not take ourselves so damn seriously. We don't need to be scrubbed of ornamentation and frivolity. It all depends on being able to get back to that point in meditation. But don't misunderstand that. I don't mean to enter a state of expectation day after day to improve your awareness. Meditation doesn't work like that. So just do it. Eventually, as time goes on, you will see the world. In meditative consciousness, you will see that nothing is more important than anything else. And there is no such thing as wasting time. Because what is time for except to be wasted? Just sit and do nothing. Meditation is the perfect waste of time. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. The universe is a transitory system like a bubble, or smoke, or foam on water. It comes and goes and dissolves, but we don't want that. We don't want to give up and go along with the disillusion. But what do we think we're going to get by holding on and resisting? I'm not preaching at you to give up. I just want you to get in touch with what it feels like inside when you contemplate the prospect of nothing. That this whole thing is just a bubble that dissolves. Mostly when people think about death, they get cold, lonely, or scared because death is an unknown. And the most frightening thing about death is that there might be something beyond it, and we don't know what that is. For children and some adults, the world seems full of danger. There are monsters everywhere, and behind every monster is death. Disillusion is the end of it all. By and large, governments fill that feared void beyond death with threats of a rather unspecified nature in order to maintain control. As long as we're scared of those threats and think that death is a bad thing, we can be ruled. This is why no government likes mystics. Mystics understand that you have to have nothing to have something. Mystics don't fear death, so you can't scare them. What is it that we fear? What do you imagine it's like to go to sleep and never wake up? It can't be like a state of being buried alive or being in the dark forever, because that would require an experience of darkness. I had the most interesting discussion recently with a young woman who was born blind. She doesn't know what darkness is. The word is absolutely meaningless to her because she's never seen light. Do you see darkness behind your eyes, behind the visual field? You can't see darkness or light. There is simply nothing conceivable at all. 
So consider that area of blankness we call death to be what lies beyond the eyes. That's what we can't think about. Here's something else to imagine. Your life, your sense of vitality, importance, aliveness of being is simply a sudden experience. It has nothing before it started and it will be nothing after it's over. That's the simplest possible thing you could believe in. It requires no intellectual effort, really. Now, what's your feeling about that? Let's suppose you feel sorrow. For whom is this sorrow? When it's all over, who will there be to feel sorry? When it's all come to an end, nobody will be there to feel sorrow or regret or happiness. That will be that. Well, let's look at it from the other direction. Suppose all this would never come to an end. So you're stuck there feeling sorrow and regret and happiness and misery over and over again. And the whole thing never stops. That's a depressing thought, isn't it? So how about a compromise? Imagine that the whole thing disappears altogether, but then it starts over again. And when it starts over again, it will feel precisely as it does now. That all this has never happened before. In Hindu thought, the universe lasts for 4,320,000 years and then it vanishes. Then it restarts and runs for another 4,320,000 years and it vanishes. Then it does it again and again and again and again. There's no end to that cycle, but our forgetting about it means it doesn't become a total insufferable ball. Between every crest of a wave, there's a trough. The Hindus saw that and contemplated the thought of moksha, liberation from the everlasting cycle of appearing and disappearing. And then the Buddha came along and taught his particular way out of samsara, the wheel of birth and death. And others came along and said, well, isn't that rather selfish? You get out, but what about everyone else? which is why the Buddha taught how to come back again and help everybody else in a very sophisticated way. Nirvana and samsara go together. They imply one another. So you're only truly released if you see that nirvana and birth and death are the same thing. Every time an incarnation occurs, it feels like this one. We might be reincarnated in a different universe as beings of an altogether different shape, but that's the shape that feels normal. That's the shape that just feels as it feels to us to feel human. We're used to this shape, so it feels normal. If we were spiders, we'd look around at other spiders and think they were normal. But all other creatures would look unusual. Just imagine how we look to a fish. Clumsy, cumbersome, and stupid looking, especially when we're attempting to swim. So in every world that comes into being or could come into being, it seems just as this world seems right now. In every incarnation, no matter how strange from this vantage point, would feel just as this incarnation feels right now. Every life form possesses some kind of awareness of superior and inferior forces. We humans generally aren't aware of species above us unless we think we've been in touch with angels or something of that sort. The things that seem superior to us are large natural processes like earthquakes or tiny organisms like viruses, although we don't attribute much intelligence to either. In any case, we feel we're in the middle that is, we look through a telescope and consider cosmic realms infinitely greater than we are. And we look through the microscope to observe worlds infinitely smaller than we are. And we seem to stand somewhere in the middle of these two situations. But we're no more in the middle than any other creature. Anything with perception always perceives itself as somehow in the middle. Anything that grows anywhere is always in the middle. And the middle always has extremes, far west, far east, the top side, the bottom side, the beginning, the end. So if you're aware of a state that you deem reality or life, this implies illusion or unreality or death. You can't know one without the other. And life isn't life without death. Knowing that it will come to an end makes it poignant and lively. Liveliness is change and motion. The only time you really feel a difference in your life is in moments of transition. Things start to get better and you feel great. Things decline and you get disappointed and gloomy. And you can go all the way down to death. It seems so final, irrevocable and permanent. What about the nothingness that went on before you were alive? This is what we've left out of our logic. We've hoodwinked ourselves by attributing powerlessness to nothingness. But just as you can't know from without the background, you can't know something life without nothing. You've heard the saying, when you're dead, you're dead. The people who came up with that saying are the p 
people who want to rule the world. They want to frighten you with the idea that death is final, that believing anything else is wishful thinking. They'll tell you to face the facts. What facts? How can I face the facts of nothing, which by definition is not a fact? People who argue what the basic reality of all this is nothingness. Physicists who think that the energy of the universe is gradually running down and dissipating, for example, ignore the fact that all of this comes from nothingness. The sixth patriarch of Zen, Heining, also known as Dajian, taught that the essence of our minds is intrinsically pure. He didn't mean non-dirty, but clear or void. He also taught the emptiness isn't blank, but abundantly full, just as empty space is full of the whole universe. Stars, moons, mountains, rivers, good people, evil people, animals, insects, and so on are all contained in the void. So out of this void comes everything, and you're it. What else could you be? What I'm illustrating is that all this fear of nothingness is just hocus pocus. Nothingness is what we should be talking about more in spirituality, but people ignore it or put down the type of discussion. But that's where the secret lies. The secret always lies in the place where you don't look for it. Where was Christ the King born? In a palace? No, he was born where no one would think of looking, in a pigsty. So you should meditate on nothingness. I know it's difficult to think about, but it will be easier when you remember that nothingness is what you are and what you were before you were born. This is an extremely important point. It's the secret to the whole thing. If you tell people this, they'll be sure to bug you about it. In this philosophy of emptiness, they'll say, there's no basis for loving other people, no basis for joy, no basis for cultivating anything good, and so on. Nonsense. If you truly explore nothingness, you'll become full of energy. So there's nothing in your way. And if that's the case, you can do this, that, and the other thing with glee and be thoroughly creative. Creativity requires nothingness, real nothingness, not some sort of darkness that resembles being buried alive forever. What is nothingness? It's beyond imagination. Your imagination exhausts itself trying to conceive of it. This is what mystics have been talking about throughout history. The Cloud of Unknowing, written in the 14th century by an English monk, was based on an earlier text called Dr. Theogia Mystica by a 6th century Syrian monk who called himself Dionysus the Areopagite. It's a fascinating short book that I translated back in 1943. It describes God entirely in negatives, not light, not power, not spirit, not father, not this, not that, not the other. The author simply negates anything anyone has ever said about God because God is infinite and is therefore beyond the reach of all conception. Anybody who, having a vision, thought he saw God would not have seen God but some creature that God has made that is less than God, he writes. This is started in such a way that even St. Thomas of Aquinas bought it. Everybody's got to agree that God is the witch of which there is no witcher, and Dionysius the Areopagite spells this out. If you assert some idea of a tangible God, then you've stopped short. You don't get the whole benefit of this ex exploration. If you insist that there's something there, a loving father at the end of the line or some kind of garden paradise, you're really cheating yourself. You have to thoroughly explore emptiness or real downright nothingness and that's what this whole zen project vedanta mysticism and what have you are all about and i think that's the simplest thing i can possibly tell you what a wonderful collection of teachings by alan watts the idea of attachment control habituation and harmonious disillusion a better understanding of the ego as this thing that you create that doesn't really exist an idea that everything comes from the void, that the nothingness is what we should be talking about. A humorous view of death and understanding that if there is a nothingness that we go into, that we will not perceive it, that it is nothing. Do you remember what happened before? There's always a very unique conception of consciousness when you talk to a Zen Buddhist in this way that may seem contradictive to some of the other stuff we've talked about. But Alan Watts has such a unique way of asking powerful questions about 
our own consciousness and what it means to be alive in the world. But the truth is, there is a letting go. The story he tells about people at the time of their death completely letting go is what I experienced. Check out my book, The Reality Revolution. I tell my own personal story and I thought I was dead. A bullet had been shot at me and it bounced off my back. I thought it went through. I was dead. I was done. And there was a letting go. A, a peace came over me. Everything was going to be okay. I talk about it in the book and I find it interesting that he mentions that as well. It is the inevitable ecstasy. Once I had this ecstasy, this feeling, I could understand everything, that everything was in, in its perfect place. I have never forgotten that. Completely changed my life. And I would love to be able to give this experience without having a near-death experience for yourself. It's a letting go. In that moment, nothing else mattered. Everything's going to be okay. I couldn't explain it, but that's what he's talking about. It's the inevitable ecstasy. A lot of this stuff is hard to understand. Very different teachings from what we've done so far. But I'd love to get your comments, your opinions of what you think about this particular lecture and these teachings. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. <laughs>